Hi, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Marshall. Welcome to Tumble, the show where we explore stories of science discovery. Today, we're learning about what Neanderthals' tools can tell us. Are these tools keeping us up with all the Neanderthal hot gossip? (laughs) Not quite, but they can answer a lot of questions about how Neanderthals lived. We'll find out how archaeologists went from blowing up caves to making stone puzzles and discover the clues within tools. I can't wait to find out right after this. Before we get started, we've got a quick pronunciation guide. This episode is about Neanderthals, which is spelled Neanderthals. Scientists pronounce it Neanderthals because it's German, and Germans pronounce sounds differently than English. We're going to pronounce it like the scientists do, but you can say Neanderthals if you want. Now that that's settled, let's get to the show. Our listener, Leo, sent us a question about Neanderthals. Hi, my name is Leo. I am seven years old. Can you name me some of the tools that Neanderthals made? Leo named a few of his own ideas. My guess of what some of the tools that they made is like hunting tools, like weapons and bow and arrows and stuff. Maybe not exactly bow and arrows, but like maybe like sharpened sticks. I mean, everyone definitely has use for a sharpened stick, but how does a scientist really know what kind of tools they use? Well, Leo has some ideas for that, too. I think that scientists can find out the real answer by looking for tools in sites or matching brain sizes to close relatives of Neanderthals that we know a lot about so that they can know that if they're really similar, they might have made the same tools. Man, Leo has some really well-thought-out ideas. I know. Now, let's ask our listeners, what kind of tools do you think Neanderthals used, and how do you think scientists would find out? To answer Leo's question, I called up Rebecca Ragsight. She's an archaeologist and wrote a book about everything scientists know about Neanderthals. I do a lot of thinking about the past and I love to write about what we know about prehistory and Neanderthals. Wow, it sounds like she's the perfect person to tell us all about Neanderthal tools. Indeed she is. And she starts all the way back when people were first beginning to discover them around 200 years ago. Lots of individual people across Europe and other places were sort of going into caves and sort of having a scratch about. They wanted to find some old bits of animals because people knew that you could get old bones out of caves. These were the early archaeologists, people who were interested in fossils and had a taste for an adventure. And apparently a taste for scratching about in caves. Sometimes they were finding stone tools. Wait, so how did they know they were finding tools and not just like rocks? What did they look like? These were pieces of stone that had been taken apart, what we call napping, and made into tools. Napping? Like they needed to take a nap from making tools? Napping is a way of shaping a stone, and it's actually spelled with K. It's not like falling asleep taking a nap, different word. For early archaeologists, these tools were a big find and a big mystery. They knew the tools were old, but they had no idea who made them or when. When the first ever Neanderthal site that we know was dug, the person who dug that up, he understood what he was looking at, but he thought that this was from people who lived just before the Romans. So even though this guy was digging up a Neanderthal site, he had no idea that they'd made the tools and that they were a lot older than Romans. Exactly. It took another couple of decades for scientists to put two and two together because Neanderthal bones and tools were usually found far apart from each other. We had the stone tools in some places, we had the bones of Neanderthals in other places, but it wasn't until the end of the 19th century that those two things happened in the same site. The site was a cave in Belgium, in Northern Europe, and it was chock full of Neanderthal remains. Sounds like an archeological gold mine. It was. They pulled out all the bones and tools that they could find lying around, and then they brought in the explosives. Wait, they did what? Archaeologists did not excavate in the way that we do today. Back in the 18 and 1900s, 
archaeologists actually use dynamite to dig out and remove things quickly. They're like, no, no, it's taking too long with my pickaxe. Let's blow it up. But weren't they worried about blowing up fossils or something? That's insane. I mean, not to mention blowing up themselves. I know, but to their credit, the floors were really hard to dig out with a pickaxe. If you ever visit a cave and you see stalagmites and stalactites hanging down, that's formed by water um, dripping down. It makes these deposits and it will form like entire floors that are like concrete hard, covering up older layers with stuff in them. Oh, wow. So the Neanderthal remains were just naturally cemented over. And so if they wanted to get through these flowstone floors is what we call them, they blew them up. (laughs) Yeah, okay. I can see getting tired of using a pickaxe on a concrete floor. But still, I mean, using dynamite seems really extreme, not to mention dangerous. Definitely. But it, it was fast. You get caves that were dug in 1870 or something, and they cleared it in two weeks. And now that would take decades (laughs) of work to dig that out. We would never do that. Whoa, so archaeologists are really stretching out that excavation time. I bet it's because they really dig it. You get it? It's a joke. (laughs) I'm sure they do dig their jobs. (laughs) And also, today's archaeologists take an entirely different approach to excavating. So the way that we do archaeology now is like light years ahead in terms of the way that it was done at the very beginning of the study of Neanderthals. Wait, so they're light years ahead of the old archaeologists, but still takes so long to dig out a site? I don't don't get it. Don't you get better and faster? (laughs) Well, it takes so long because archaeology is so much more detailed, especially when it comes to tools. The big difference now is that we don't just collect all the big stuff, the nicely shaped tools. We're interested in all of the bits that came off during that process of production because it's been realised over many decades that you can actually reconstruct the process of making the object by refitting things back together. Wait, wait, so how do you refit things back together? Basically, they pick up all the tiny chipped away pieces of stone from the floors of Neanderthal sites and put them back together like a jigsaw puzzle. What you can do is dig up your layer, get all the stone objects, and you lay them out on a table, and then you basically, one by one, try and fit them back together. Man, that would take a ton of patience. You're basically just fitting shards of old stone together. I know. It sounds extremely tedious, but it's also worth it because this process basically recreates the moment when a Neanderthal made the tool. When you fit all of those back together, you can literally watch the process and the decisions that they made. Wow, that sounds really cool. I mean, not that I'd want to do that, because I don't think I have the patience to put together all those pieces of rock, but it's cool that other people do. What that has shown us is that Neanderthals were far, far away from just smashing stuff. You know, bash, bash, that's not what's going on. So what was going on? How did they make those tools? They had many different, really specific, systematic ways of taking stone apart. In some cases, we can watch them switch between one method and another on the same block of stone as they encounter a problem. So they start off doing it one way and they're like, oh, no, it's not going well. I'm going to switch to this other method. Wow. So it's like we can read the thoughts of a Neanderthal. I know. It's so awesome. And that's what those early archaeologists miss by only seeing the big finish tools and blowing the place up. (laughs) So what we can see by keeping all the stuff, is so much richer than what we would have learned if we had only kept the finished article. Okay, so that's stone tools, but what about the, like, wooden tools and the sharpened sticks Leo asked about? Yeah, those get a deep look too. We basically just study everything to the max, so, you know, we will zoom in and we can identify the different species of wood. They can even see what parts of the tree Neanderthals made the tools from. They are choosing the parts of the tree that are the strongest. They're carving them in a way that's not straight down the branch, but off at an angle. And that makes it stronger, too, when it sort of gets you know stuck in an animal. It's not going to shatter. 
All right. So they weren't just like pulling down random branches and then making them pointy and calling them spears. (laughs) Exactly. The materials were carefully chosen and the tools were well constructed. So where Leo was talking about wooden spears and things like this, what we do know is that Neanderthals sometimes made what we call composite tools. So that just means tools made of more than one part. Archaeologists think these parts might have been bound together by plants or animal tissue. Those haven't been preserved, but what has been found is Neanderthal glue. Wait, glue? Like Elmer's from the bottle? Not from the bottle. (laughs) We can see that they made glues. So little lumps of stuff, just little smears that are stuck on stone tools. That's amazing. I I mean, I don't know how to make glue, so how did they? (laughs) Well, archaeologists analyzed the chemicals in those little lumps and smears and discovered it used to be very sticky. We can say that Neanderthals knew how to make glue from birch bark, which requires cooking it, basically, for a considerable amount of time. So, wow, I mean, you'd have to have a lot of patience to make this stuff, but honestly, not as much as putting together a stone tool. (laughs) For sure. And Neanderthals were making other tools that weren't for hunting. There are other wooden objects as well, digging sticks, which may not sound as exciting as spears, but actually they are super important for everyday life. So, wait, let me guess. A digging stick is a stick that you use to dig. You are correct. Neanderthals wouldn't dig with any old stick. They made special ones for that. Certainly what we see is even when they're making digging sticks, they make the same really careful choices about the kind of tree and how they actually make that tool. So sometimes they use very strong, hard woods, which are really difficult to carve, and then they will use fire to help them soften the wood up and actually carve that off. I can almost see the Neanderthals around the fire, like just boiling glue, softening sticks. Having a good time. (laughs) (laughs) Hanging out. (laughs) Yeah, we can actually know that they did these things. These tools really give us a picture into the past. But Leo mentioned studying other living species with similar brain sizes to find out how Neanderthals might have made tools. So is that a thing? Yeah, this was a really cool thing that Leo said because it is really close to what we do and the way that we've worked over decades. Archaeologists and primatologists, or people who study primates, have observed other primates like chimps and bonobos making tools in the wild, but they lack some important skills. They don't seem to have the same understanding of geometry in order to be able to come anywhere near to the more complicated methods of making stone tools that Neanderthals had mastered. Neanderthal tools show us that Neanderthals were more advanced than we often give them credit for. And we know that thanks to slow, careful archaeology. This is what's really fascinating about how modern archaeology works, that we apply our clever scientific techniques and sometimes we find things that are completely unexpected and they open up a complete other window onto what Neanderthals were up to that we would never have known before. So, no more blowing up caves, even though it was probably cool to watch. Exactly. What's hiding in the dirt has showed us that Neanderthals are more like humans than we thought. I would say that they are another kind of human. They're another way of being a human. They were different in some ways, but there's so much more shared between us than what makes us different. Thanks to Dr. Rebecca Rag Sykes, Honorary Fellow in the School of Archaeology, Classics, and Egyptology at the University of Liverpool in England. She is also the author of Kindred, Neanderthal Life, Love, Death, and Art. That's a book for adults, and I highly recommend it. Thanks as well to Leo Likes Gould for his excellent question. To learn more about Neanderthals, listen to our bonus interview episode with Rebecca. It's available to patrons who pledge just $1 a month or more on patreon.com slash tumblepodcast. I'm Lindsay Patterson, and I produce the show with help from Casey Georgie. Eric Kuhn is our engineer and mixer. I'm Marshall Escamilla, and I make all the music for Tumble. 
Tumble is a production of Tumble Media. Thanks for listening, and join us next time for more stories of science discovery.